Well, hello, Greg. Uh, good morning. How's it going? Good. So you were born in, in Iowa. How much time did you spend there before you moved to Minnesota? Uh, so my family actually lived in Rock Island, Illinois. Uh, my mom was Catholic and the only Catholic hospital in the Quad Cities was in Davenport. So I only spent, I don't know, a few days in Iowa. Oh, then, oh uh, okay. And then went home to Rock Island, and six months later, my family moved to Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and I lived there until I was probably four and a half or so, and then we moved to Minnesota. My mom, uh, my mom's family is from uh, the uh, South Saint Paul, so we moved back to Minnesota, and I've been here ever since. And I've been in Red Wing for over forty years now. Wow! Do Do you remember um, the first music that you listened to when you were a child? Like, was it was it a musical household? Uh, yeah. So my my sister is nine years older than I am, mm -hmm. and so she was watching. Um, you know, I, I remember, you know, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, um, things like that. Uh, she listened to uh, to a lot of music. I've got an older brother. He was really into, um, you know, like Hendrix and Zeppelin and things like that. I was exposed to that as I was growing up. Uh, my dad actually was really into... Um, a big Stan Kenton fan. So he listened to a lot of big band music and, and um, he loved Tony Bennett. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was exposed to music from an early age and a really wide variety of stuff. Did, did anyone play instruments or anything in your family? Uh, I'm the only one. When, when did you actually, was the, was it the bass that you picked up first or did you start on guitar and how old were you when that happened? It was the, uh, yeah, the bass was my first instrument. Um, I got my first bass for my, um, 13th birthday. Wow. And, um, you know, listening to, um, you know, definitely an early influence there was, uh, you know, McCartney's bass lines and, and um, uh, you know, the Beatles and, and his solo stuff. And then um, uh, discovered the band Yes. Chris Squire. Chris was, Squire. Good one. Was an amazing bass player. And and uh, of course, later the Who. And and, um, you, you know, when I was 14, I started I got a job as an usher at a theater downtown St. Paul. And it was right next to a record store. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, I made a couple of lifelong friends there. Uh, the, the two guys that, that ran the store were both uh, really big into jazz. One was a, a huge Coltrane fan and the other uh, friend who actually ended up being one of my best friends, uh, uh, was huge into Miles Davis. And, um, you know, so this is 70, 73. So, you know, 72, 73, all sorts of great records were coming out. And I was, yeah. you know, uh, getting exposed to them. And, and um, JC and I kind of drifted apart for a few years. We ended up, I ended up getting a job at a record store after I got out of height high school and JC was working there. So, and that was, uh, early 1978. That's where I met Grant. Was that cheapo records? Uh, well, it was, uh, a store owned by the same guy called Melody Lane. It was in a, in a strip mall out in, in, in West St. Paul. But Grant and I just, you know, we both embraced punk and everything that came out and came into the store that even looked remotely punk. We would listen to it. And, um, you know, at this point, Grant's only 16. Uh, we started going to the Longhorn Bar in Minneapolis to see punk shows. And 
you know, and Grant looked like he was 25 when he was 16. So, uh, you know, the, the legal age was 18 in Minnesota at the time. Um, I actually, the first time Grant got carded at the Longhorn was on his 18th birthday, ironically enough, but good timing. <laughs> so you guys actually worked together at the record store for a little while. Uh, we did. And how did uh, Bob end up into your world? I imagine maybe he came walking into the store one day or something like that. Yeah. So uh, Grant and I both ended up working at Cheapo, uh, which was in St. Paul on the um, basically right next to the McAllister College campus. And um, Grant was working I think it was like a Saturday, he brought in a uh, PA speaker, hooked it up to the stereo, had it out on the sidewalk, and he was playing the Ramones. And Bob uh, had just shown up from Malone, New York, was walking down the street, heard the Ramones, went in and said, hey, I know these guys. And and um, so that's how Bob and, and Grant met. I didn't really meet Bob for a few months later. Now, uh, you you guys ended up um, playing in a band called Buddy in the Returnables. Is that was that the first band that you were in with a guy named Charlie Pine? Yeah, you know the story there is. Uh, so Charlie was the the manager at Cheapo, and um, uh, Charlie Grant, myself. Uh, Jerry uh, Reinhardt, who who uh, was uh, uh, my first girlfriend and ended up being my first wife, uh, and another friend, Bill Haas, we all ended up at this little uh, dive bar in St. Paul called Ron's Randolph Inn. And Charlie came back from the bar with a couple of pitchers of beer, and he said to Grant, it's like, Grant, we need to put a band together because I just got us a gig. And uh, and we're all like, what? What are you talking about? He's like, oh, well, I was at the bar and I saw that they had had bands. And so I asked the bartender and she and she said, why do you have a band? And he said, yeah. And she said, OK, you're playing here then March 30th and 31st. And this was late January. And uh, uh, 1970, uh, 79. And Grant's like, oh, well, I know a guy at McAllister. He's got a flying V. And uh, so the next day, Grant and I picked Bob up, uh, went back to my house in Mendota Heights, where Grant's drum kit was set up. And uh, we ended up jamming a bunch of Ramones tunes. And uh, then we started getting together with Charlie and learning the set. Uh, we did three sets of all covers, but like all like a wide variety of really eclectic stuff. Um, you know, we there were some Ramones, some Buzzcocks, some uh, Velvet Underground, some Parubu, nice. uh, a lot of Rock Pile, you know, Nick Lowe, Elvis Costello, um, some Gene Vincent, some Eddie Cochran, uh, you know, just really a, a wide mix of stuff. But after the first night, Bob and Grant and I were like, you know, hey, playing together is like kind of fun. We should keep doing this. And then we're like, yeah, but let's not do it with Charlie. <laughs> you know, Charlie was just a couple of years older than us. But, uh, you know, he seemed, you know, to us, he, he just didn't quite fit with what we wanted to do. So uh, the three of us started getting together and practicing and rehearsing and learning how to write songs. And um uh, a few weeks later, a couple of weeks later, Charlie called up and said, Hey, we've got another gig at McAllister college. It's for their spring fest. We're playing in the, um, you know, uh, at, at the, uh, in the big hall, the grand union hall or whatever it's called. And so we went up, we played our set with Charlie. And at the end of the night, they're like, Oh, you guys still have like 15 minutes. You can play whatever you want. So the three of us seized the opportunity and got up there and started playing our original music. So that's really the the first Husker official Husker thing. And we actually called ourselves Husker do right out of the gate. 
Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about the name, actually. Yeah, so Charlie, you know, Charlie told the bar that that uh, the band was called Buddy and the Returnables, and as we're learning, you know, working on the set, you know, we were like, yeah, we don't really like the name Buddy and the Returnables because that means you're Buddy and we're the Returnables. And- <laughs> We don't want to be returnable. So um, <laughs> uh, we, we, I, I suggested who's for do because it, you know, meant, do you remember? Uh, we all kind of liked it because it, it was, uh, you know, since it was a foreign language, uh, it didn't really pigeonhole us for like a sound or anything like that. And we actually made up flyers that said first time in the U S <laughs> Who's Kurt who at Ron's Randolph Inn? So the first gig really, I, I always, I read somewhere that the first gig with it was at Jay's Longhorn Barn in, uh, Bar in uh, May 1980. Was that like the first official Who's gig? gig? Uh, yeah, pretty much. So we actually, we played one. So after that um, show at McAllister College, we played uh, just down the street. We were actually now I was working at a different record store called Northern Lights. And that's where we were rehearsing in the basement. And just a block down was a place called um, Christensen's, another dive bar. And we had talked them into letting us play there. And we played, uh, went in and played, you know, maybe had a dozen friends or so show up. They paid us a case of beer. And uh and after that, Bob was, you know, the the school year had wrapped up, summer was coming on, and he was like, well, if we don't have any more gigs, I might go home to Malone for the summer. So the next day, Grant, like, you know, gets hold of everybody and says, oh, we need to get to the Longhorn today. We've got an audition. I set up an audition. And so we throw all the gear in the car, drive to uh, over to Minneapolis, and it's like, uh, I think we showed up right at noon and they're, they had a sidebar where they had a businessman's like afternoon um, buffet type thing set up. And we set up all our gear and started playing and uh, uh, Hartley Frank, the, the club manager came out and he's like, what are you guys doing? And, you know, it's like, Grant's like, oh, well, we want to play here. And he's like, fine, you can play next Friday. Just shut the fuck up and get out of here. So that was that was the audition. And then um, and that was the start of us playing out as, you know, officially, you know, who's do playing all original music at um, and actually that tonight Longhorn release that we just put out uh, kind of documents that that first show and um, a couple of, you know, and then um, the last three sides skip forward a year, uh, which really shows a pretty amazing evolution of the band in, in just a year's time. And then uh, the last side is our last official set at the Longhorn. And, um, and then after that, it was, you know, the Longhorn had, changed its name to Zoogies. Uh, the club just didn't have, you know, wasn't the same anymore, but the entry now was was pretty much open, 7th Street entry mm-hmm. and was in full swing. And we started playing there a lot. Uh, we played there, you know, at least a couple of times a month. Um, I think in September of, of um 1980 i think we actually played the longhorn like uh either in the long or not the longhorn we played uh in the entry or doing cameos in the main room which was called First uncle step. sam's at that point uh they hadn't even uh they, i think they dropped the uncle at that part it was just called sam's they hadn't rebranded the first avenue yet but we played you know every week we were there and um you know basically we were kind of living at the entry and going to shows and supporting other bands and and uh at this point we've got a a rabid group of followers uh that were affectionately referred to as the husker veggies and um and actually four of those guys started a band called man-sized action they started their own band and 
uh, good times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you released your first single, Statues, on your own. I think Reflex was your own label in 81. Was with with the replacements already around? Because everyone always wants to talk about the... Was there really a competition and revival, rivalry going on between you two bands at that time? Or is that just a... As time goes on, it's a fictional thing. I mean, did it really happen? No, was there it- there was there was definitely a healthy rivalry there. You know, they they basically started playing at uh, the Longhorn the same time that we did. Did you and, know all uh, those guys then? Uh, well, you know, we we were just starting to get to know them. You know, um, we were the band that was from St. Paul. St. Paul being the uncool city, you know, and everybody else was from Minneapolis, you know, they were the cool city. Uh, so it, you know, it took a little while for us to, to break into the scene. Um, but we did it just by, by playing and, and playing fast and furious and, and, um, uh, so the replacements were on a label called twin tone, yeah. which was like the local, punk label so uh they had the suburbs they had uh the replacements they had um a band called fingerprints they uh they put out a uh, big hits of mid-america volume three was it or volume four so basically you know a take on the uh, the old soma big hits record compilations from the from the early 60s but twin tone was owned by uh run by three guys um and um peter jesperson who was one of the one of the the guys who who um owned the label was also kind of managing the replacements um and so we had submitted a three song demo that we recorded at blackberry way and statues was one of the songs um of each of the three principals, they each liked a different song and nobody could um, nobody could come to a consensus on, on what they wanted to do with us. So they decided to pass on putting out a Who's Do record. So that's when we decided to do it ourselves, put it out on our own label. Uh, reflex, because that was our reflex reaction to, <laughs> oh, well, you don't like us? Well, fine, we'll just put it out ourselves. And um, so that's how Reflex was born. But yeah, no, there was always, you know, through through the years, there was a healthy rivalry between the two bands. We played a lot of shows together, you know, and each band was always trying to blow the other band off the stage. Uh, I like to think that we always came out on top, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and it's um, it's one of those things where where each band wanted the other band to be the second best band in town that must have been incredible i i know you guys got on the Minutemen's radar uh was it d boone or mike watt that actually asked you guys to to be on new their label new alliance do you and and also part two of the question is how did you get to know these other bands in other cities and which ones did you know did you were you touring yet or like how did that this that all period happen because it seemed like a a big break for you guys to get in with those guys. Yeah. uh, You know, playing in the entry, we, we opened up for a lot of really incredible bands and and made some good connections. We opened up for mission of Burma. Uh, We opened up for DOA and uh, another Vancouver band called the subhumans and bands. Yep. And actually uh, Ken Lester, who was DOA's, manager uh really liked us and and hooked us up with a lot of phone numbers for um uh gigs in canada uh but it was in march of 81 we made our first official uh out of town show we played at, at a club in chicago called oz and that's where we met uh you know uh jeff pizzotti and uh the guys from naked ray gun and and um uh, uh the guys in strike under and and the effigies and black flag happened to be playing the night after we were done at oz and the guy that owned the club was like hey i'm putting on the black flag show i can't get you on that bill but i want you to play 
the after show party back here at Oz. So we all went and saw Black Flag and uh, Des was the lead singer. They actually had Henry with them. I think they had just picked him up in DC and were bringing him back out to California. Wow. Thank you. Um, he only had one tattoo. He had uh, the, the the black flag, the four towels tattoo, a small one on it on his bicep, and um, uh, so I don't even think Henry got up that night. But at the after show party, we played our set, and uh, the band, you know, Black Flag was there. Uh, Spot was with them, and uh, you know that's how we made that connection and then with ken lester's hookups we we booked the uh the children's crusade uh tour which started in in 81 uh actually the last week of june in 81 we played four nights at the calgarian hotel in calgary alberta and uh almost got fired after the first night because nobody was there but uh, some of the local guys talked the bar into letting us stay on and then they had their bands open for us for the weekend ended up working out really great and then we went to Vancouver stayed at Dave Gregg's house and played some shows with uh, DOA and played um, had a our own show with the Smiling Buddha with, with a band called Inek. Um oh no I can't think of what they were called wasn't it in excess that's Completely different band, different <laughs> country. Uh, did a gig on um, Canada Day with uh, the Subhumans in Victoria. And then from there, made it down to Seattle. And it was in Seattle where we actually talked our way onto opening for the Dead Kennedys. Um, so we played first, then a... a Local band called the Farts played. I think DOA were also on that bill, and then um, the Kennedys played, and Biafra uh, really liked us and uh, said, "Like, well, come on down to San Francisco. I'll I'll find you guys some gigs. You can stay at my house." So we, after Seattle, we had one show in Portland, Oregon, which actually is kind of surprisingly widely circulated as a bootleg that it's um um it was at a club called euphoria and got down to san francisco uh we we uh got gigs at mabue gardens and uh dirk dirksen really liked us so he got us a couple more shows we from there we played uh another show with doa in sacramento uh there's a gig flyer that's out there where we're billed as who screwed uh, you, which actually <laughs> that show never actually happened, uh, <laughs> even though it's it, the, the flyer is out there. Uh, you know, we, you know, so in, in San Francisco, we, that first gig at Mabue Gardens, we played with seven seconds. So that's where we meet Kevin and, um, You this know, is and, incredible. And this is an incredible story. You met all of those people. Yeah. Wow. At yeah. one time. And, uh, you know, we played uh, played a show with Flipper in, in, in Berkeley, you know, met those guys. Um, what did you what did you think of them when you saw them for the first time? Oh, they were they were great. <laughs> I they love Flipper. Incredible. Yeah. And then uh, so we're still trying to get something lined up for la and uh i i had gotten mike watts phone number and i had talked to him uh on the phone a couple of times and and uh, you know la was was <clears throat> la was a hard place to get a gig just because <clears throat> it, the uh there wasn't any established like you know sure there was the whiskey and club lingerie places like that but for most a lot of the punk bands they were like pop-up shows and uh so watt was trying to uh you know i had sent sent him uh you know some tapes of uh live tapes of us and he he was trying to find find us a gig nothing was coming up so 
at this point, we had, li had been living with Jello Biafra for almost a month. And we're like, you know, we can't get anything in LA. We should head back to Minneapolis. So we booked a show for the 7th Street entry on uh, August 14th. And that's uh, when we re recorded Land Speed Record. So we uh, actually drove straight from San Francisco to Chicago, played O'Banions in Chicago the night before, get to Minneapolis and played the entry, recorded Land Speed Record and on a four track. And when we had that finished, we sent it to SST. Uh, they didn't really feel that that would be the right, you know, they, they were interested in working with us, but they didn't feel that that was the right record to start with us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, they were like, you know, Mike Watt has a label called New Alliance. I'll, they were gonna, you know, they're like, well, we'll ask him. And they mentioned it to him and Watt's like, oh, we'll put it out. I don't even have to hear the tape. I, I know those guys. They're the, the, the record fucking shreds. So, well, shred. So New Alliance put it out without even hearing it. And, uh, and then our next tour out was to um, uh, basically make our way out to, to L.A. So, you know, and that, that tour got us through Texas where we, you know, we meet the big boys uh, in the dicks and you know then we get out to LA and we you know meet them you know it's like you know the Minuteman and the Meat Puppets and Saccharin Trust and you know I mean of course Black Flag was was you know the the uh, the crown jewel of the SST catalog since it you know Greg Gid's band Greg Ginn's label but uh, you know we really became great friends with with uh watt and and uh d boone and george hurley and then uh the kirkwoods and and uh derek bostrom and you know husker minuteman meat puppets that was kind of like the trifecta for yeah. for sst and and the three bands played a lot of shows together uh yeah i mean it's you know watt and is is um uh, has been a lifelong friend the kirkwoods are lifelong friends um you know it's uh you know it, it yeah it's kind of kind of a crazy story when when did you guys make it to the east coast was it later than that because we're around like 82 now i mean land speed came out in 82 and that was like still new alliance then Everything Falls Apart was 83 with uh, the Metal Circus EP. Were you guys already getting to the East Coast by then? Because I remember you coming to Boston, where I'm from. I can't remember the years, but you guys became pretty popular pretty quickly on the in New England anyways. Yeah, we uh, uh, we went East in, in um, 83. Yeah, and, that's um, what I thought. Yeah, so we toured our way out. Um, yeah, actually, we got up to Boston and the show was sold out, which surprised us because we were thinking, you know, it's like, all right, well, we had to, you know, really start from nothing and on the West Coast and, and earn ourselves a name and a reputation to get people to come out to shows. And we were thinking we're we would have to rebuild that on the East coast. And then we got out there and particularly Boston and it's like, wow, the place is packed. What's going on. And it's like, Oh, there's a thing called college radio here. Yeah. <laughs> like what? Exactly. So, um, yeah, no. Yeah. So, uh, where'd we play in Bo Mavericks? Yeah. It was Maver the first gig in Boston. And, uh, and that was great. You know, and of course, mission of Burma, uh, those guys, uh, also have been you know lifelong friends uh they helped us out uh it was a year later that rem actually called us up and said hey we we're playing the field house at harvard and we want you guys to open for us so we uh jumped in the van and drove out to uh uh out to cambridge and and uh played that show and and played um played a gig at the rat with mission of Burma and yeah, no, Boston was always great. Uh, the living room in Providence was, was a fantastic place to play. 
you know, New York was a lot of different clubs. Uh, Philly was great. You know, DC at the nine thirty club was great. You know, there were a lot of really great spots. Um, um, at this point, like by, you know, you started to really pick up steam, like uh, after metal circus, that was a great record, by the way, Zen arcade. <laughs> I mean, when that record came out in 84, I had moved to California at that point. By the way, I was one of those music directors at a college station that was playing you back in 83 when you before you came to Boston. I just want to mention that. But well, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> but uh it things really exploded for you guys after Metal Circus, I thought. And when Zen Arcade came up, that bass line, by the way, and something I learned today is just fantastic. I just want to mention that. Because that record like was Absolutely a mind blowing record. Uh, do you remember? Um, I, word has it that that SST made five thousand copies of that record, and they ran out, and you guys ended up on the road. But there were no more records. Is that true? Did that really happen? Uh, that is true. Yeah, we uh, they the first pressing sold out like right away, and we were like in the middle of a tour, and I think we're on the East Coast actually, and and there were no records, and um i can't remember how long it took them to get the second pressing out but you know zen arcade was was a record that that as we were writing the songs we were putting together the concept for the album so i mean it it was a it was a concept album from at in its creation um and uh you know they were Car joe carducci was running the label at uh was a little leery of a double album but then you know when he heard it he's like oh man this is great now the funny part about this is that um the Minuteman had... double nickels on the dime I knew you right. I knew where you were going go ahead sorry right so they they had actually um recorded their record it was a it was just a single and the record was going to be called Nothing to Hide. And the cover photo was going to be the three of them naked. But when they heard that we were putting out a double album, they were like, holy shit, Husker's doing a double. We better do a double, too. So they quick uh, started writing songs, getting back into the studio to record enough material for, uh, for Double Nickels. And, you know, they had a lot of, um, uh, like Joe Carducci wrote the lyrics for Jesus and Tequila. Uh, a few other people wrote some lyrics for them. So they, they quick put it all together. And, uh, you know, and, and we didn't know that they were coming out with a double. And then, of course, uh, SST releases both records at the same time. And on the inside, of course, it says, take that, Hooskers. You know, they're like, oh, you guys are doing a double. We're doing a double, too. But I remember that well, says, we yeah. we it, we spared the world from, uh, <laughs> you know, the horror of seeing uh, <laughs> the three of them naked on the on the record cover. So I remember I was working on Enigma Records at that time out in California, and we couldn't believe it when both those double albums both came out. We're like, how the hell are we supposed to match this? I mean, and yep. plus, you know, it was a. Two Black Flag records came out that year, too. SST's best year by far. Now, New, New Day Rising, so, was that record already recorded when Zen Arcade came out? Did I read that, or did you do that right after Zen Arcade? Uh, we were probably actually re recording it when Zen Arcade came out. Uh, we recorded New Day Rising in Minneapolis. So that was the... Uh, Zen Arcade was the last record we did at Total Access with Spot. And then uh, Spot came to Minneapolis. Because I'm pretty sure we, we were working on that in July of 84. So, yeah, we were recording it at the same time that it came out. And then New Day came out in uh, the beginning of 85. And Flip Your Wig came out at the end of, you know, September of 85. Um. Did you guys so already was, get, I'm sorry, did you guys had, I, is it true that you guys already had been offered a major label deal before this, before Flip Your Wig, a different label, and you guys said no? We, uh, we actually started getting 
major label attention even before Zen was released. Really? But once Zen Arcade came out, then we were getting a lot of of um uh, of interest. Um there was one uh one letter from one a and R guy that basically he had just typed, "I love your band, I love your band, I love your band, I love your band, I love your band," just over and over and over again. And we had decided to uh, we we had met Karen Bird uh, from Warner Brothers, and she really wanted the band. And you know, it was kind of like you know, uh, Karen working with us and, and letting us know that, you know, Warner's was an artist uh, oriented label and that, uh, you know, they would allow us to, you know, they wouldn't mess with us. They wouldn't tell us what to do in the studio. They wouldn't, you know. Um, so we decided that Warner Brothers was was the uh, the spot for us to, to land. And I know that she really, really, really wanted flip your wig, and um, and I'm not exactly sure why we decided to to give SST one last record, but we did. So SST got flip your wig, and then um, you know we officially signed the Warner's. I think right after, shortly after Flip came out, and uh, you know, and then gave them a really dark record in, in, um, candy apple gray, which I think they were like, what? <laughs> yeah. Cause but, uh, uh, makes no sense at all. was like, to me, like the birth of the whole pop core sound, you know, when that song came out, it was like, Oh man, these guys could do pop and like make it sound good, you know? And yeah. is it, that record sold 50,000 copies in four months. I know that's not made up because SST really benefited off of that record. Um, yeah. Now, Warner's let you guys record your pretty much do your own thing. Like they did hold their word on that, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They, um, you know, so we recorded. The EP uh, came out first. Uh, sorry, uh, somehow, right? Uh, no, that was. Um, that you know all the um don't want to know if you're lonely and sorry somehow were pulled as uh singles from from the album uh off of uh candy apple gray right but they, they allowed us you know we recorded in minneapolis they allowed bob and grant to be the producers <laughs> uh you know flip was the first record that we did without spot uh you know, and, and really, uh, you know, Bob, Bob and Grant were really heavily involved. Was Lou Giordano? Because I know he's a Boston guy. He he had yep. something to do with those, the Minneapolis records. Was he the engineer on those? Lou was our, our live sound guy. So um, we actually met Lou when, um, so SST put together a, a package tour a, a five show run of, on the East coast. Um, the channel in Boston, uh, living room in Providence, Danceteria in New York city, uh, love hall in Philly and the nine thirty club in, in, um, DC. It's a good tour. <laughs> it's a good tour. <laughs> and so, uh, that's the first time where we really met Lou, uh, SST line blew up to um, pretty. Sure, I want to say that the uh, the the van and the gear that we use uh, belong to SSD. Yeah. Uh, SSD control the, the Boston band. Yeah. And uh, so he lined up the gear and the band and uh, picks us up at the airport and then uh, we pick up the Minutemen uh, the next day. So actually, that, that first night in New York City was great because Lou borrowed a car from a friend and we just drove around New York City and uh, drank beers and did all sorts of fun things like going up and taking a piss on Grant's tomb and, uh, you know, stuff like that. You know, <laughs> all, the, all that, all the, all the big tour stuff that you want to do. And um, so that's where and, and then Lou did um, did sound for both bands. 
and it was a great tour. We really liked Lou. And so after that, we asked Lou to, to come out on the road with us. So he became our, he was our, our road sound guy and, um, uh, you know, became a great friend and, and, um, was with us right up until the end, uh, Lou's big contribution to the Husker, uh, albums was he put together, uh, the whole living end, uh, right uh record basically you know he was recording he he did uh board digital board tapes of uh every show on that last tour so incredible um i know i'm, I'm gonna move along because there's other things i want to talk to you about here uh warehouse songs and stories was the last record and then i don't know if how you want to wrap this up but everything just fell apart in 1987 i guess they were dark times for you guys and you just called it quits. I mean, I don't know how you want to put a stamp on that. Yeah. You know, um, you know, Warner's was, was a good label and allowed us to do what we wanted to do. But the, um, you know, one of the things about moving on to a major is, uh, you know, they do want you to have management. They do want, you know, I mean, we were already working with Frank Riley, um, with, uh, for, booking. for booking shows yeah. before we went to Warner's, but you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, we had always done all of this stuff ourselves. We, you know, uh, put it all together. So as, as you're on a major, a lot of those things are removed from your, off your to-do list that are taken care of by other people. But at the same time, it's there's a larger demand now for your time for uh, for press and for in stores and and things like that. So and and the rift the the uh, the the excuse me the writing battle between Bob and Grant actually kind of I mean it really started before warners but uh you know it, it it came to a head on um candy apple gray and uh warehouse was was also you know i think it's one of those things where where bob uh wanted could you be the one to be the first single and warners like picks don't want to know if you're lonely um which is actually our most streamed song yeah. on spot I like two to one to uh, could you be the one? And uh, you know, so there were there were definitely tensions that had been building for a long time, and then um, you know it uh, it comes out that that Grant has been you know using heroin, and and uh, that was on our very last the last tour that we did, um, which was in December of eighty. 87 you know bob according you know grant's version is that at that point he he left the band uh bob's version is that bob you know technically bob uh, sent a letter in january of 88 withdrawing himself from the warner's contract so you can pick either one of those as as the actual end date of, of who's do <laughs> but um yeah, it was uh, you know, the band was was definitely uh on a on a fast track. I mean, we were pretty much right, you know, on on the uh the ladder rung right behind REM on on the climb up up the charts and, and things like that. So it was a good run. Yep. Um, I know you were in gray area for a little while in eighty eight, and I don't want to just blow right by that. But I do want to talk to you about Norton's Restaurant. And the reason I want to talk to you about that is because I worked in the music business my whole life. And then I got a friend of mine opened up a taco shop in Pittsburgh when I moved there to work for an independent label. And I lost my job and I didn't know what I was going to do. So he introduced me to the food industry and I started working and it was fun when I worked with him. But then when I went to work for other places, when I moved, I found out that the restaurant business is not an easy business. 
Now you no. opened a restaurant. So I wanted to get your take on this because for me, the food industry is very difficult. Uh, it is. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had uh, worked in restaurants uh, in the early years of the band, uh, always working in the front of the house. I liked, I liked uh, the front of the house. I had a good, good knack for, um, waiting tables and it was good good money and so after the band broke up i i just kind of drifted back to restaurants and uh met a really good uh friend who was the executive chef for the the restaurant that i worked at uh you know he he went on to to be one of the top midwest chefs and you know uh top chefs in the country uh nominated for a lot of james beard awards and I kind of followed him around to um, a few of the different places that he was the uh, the chef at. And uh, after um, uh, Gray Area uh, broke up, he called me up and he's like, hey, I need help in the kitchen. Uh, so I went in and started working in the back of the house. And, and uh, he started just training and teaching me and uh, said like your job is to be a sponge and just soak up as much info as you can uh, this was a place in Minneapolis called Fagries and uh, you know basically he had like three sous chefs that were all really incredible like you know uh, chefs as well and and I really learned a lot there and um, uh Later on, I ended up working in a place where I, I <laughs> ended up becoming the chef because the guy that was the uh, running the the place was, was an alcoholic and basically got himself fired one night. And they're like, well, you seem to know what you're doing, so you're in charge now. So that was like the first kitchen. That was a place in Red Wing called River Reach. And... Uh, Ended up working for Lenny again at uh, Lenny Russo at a couple other restaurants. And that was um, in 1995, there was a place in Red Wing that was uh, uh, being built out. And I could tell it was going to be some sort of bar or restaurant and just walked in there one day while there were uh, people in there, met the owners, Ryan and Peggy Knudsen, and didn't walk in thinking I was going to get a job. I was just walking in just to see what their concept was. And then they offered me a job and I opened up Staghead in um, September of 1995. And uh, was there for seven and a half years as their wow. uh, chef and general manager and uh, wine buyer. And, and then uh, I left in 2000 and uh, must have been early 2003 and then opened up my own place uh norton's and i was uh you know basically had my own place for seven years and got out of the restaurant business in 2010 uh, and then went over to wine sales and uh, sold you know been selling wine since 2010 and Oh, that's cool. Um, I didn't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. you know, I, I, as the, as the wine buyer for Staghead and then my own place, I really learned, you know, I had really great reps that um, I learned a lot from. And then I, you know, also owning your own place, you went, you're there all the time and there's times where it's slow and you end up, um, um, sitting around so i started reading books about wine and learning as much as i can and you know i actually was lucky enough to go on some uh some wine trips back then and you know, they're starting to cut the grass hold on one second um while you're moving i'm gonna uh, fast forward one more Just time here <clears throat> Okay. Um, so anyway, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. Oh well, I was just going to say that. Um, um, yeah. No. So I, it was a 
I, it's like everything that I've always done. I, I kind of really dive into it and, and uh, uh, learn as much as I can. So you got back into music though. And I know you played with porcupine and um, uh, what you've learned isn't real played on that. The video for lifetime is pretty cool. I really like that. And um, after that, I mean, I know you got sick um i'm not i'm not sure exactly when but i guess you're okay now but you had you you pretty much had cancer right yeah i had um i was lucky enough to get diagnosed with prostate cancer and i say lucky enough because they caught it early and okay looks like the lawnmower has moved away (laughs) um so yeah you know at um Actually, how I got back into music, I'm going to just hit on this real quick because I didn't pick up a bass for 14 years. Really? Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, I, you know, 20 years in, in the restaurant business, uh, I just, you know, rest, like you said, restaurants are hard work. They're, they're long hours. They're, they're uh, tough hours. It's hot. It's your uh, physically demanding and um and and i had thrown myself headlong into becoming a chef so uh just didn't really have time for the bass wasn't sure if i'd ever play the bass again and that met a good friend dave king who is the drummer for the the jazz trio the bad plus or actually they're now a jazz quartet uh and uh dave kind of got me back into playing bass with um with a band uh, that we put together called Gang Font. And then, uh, yeah, Porcupine, uh, Casey Virak uh, called me up and and um, I played with them for three and a half years. Or, um, no, probably longer, maybe five years. And, uh, you know, and that was great. Uh, it just didn't work out in the end, a, a little clash of personalities i think and then um but after that uh finney mcconnell from the mahones had contacted me and said hey let's put a band together with jamie oliver from the uk subs and the original concept was we're just going to do uh just get together for fun and play some husker covers and some mahones covers and maybe throw in some uk subs tunes and on a on a whim, I decided to fly to Berlin to meet these guys because uh, Finney had some studio time booked. And this was uh, September of 21. And I fly to Berlin. I meet both these guys for the first time. We ended up writing a record in, in two days. And... Uh, and here comes the one more again. There he goes. Hold on. <laughs> An ultra bomb is born. So anyway, we record the record in two days and that uh, that's how ultra bomb is, is born. And I know uh, you guys played punk rock bowling because I watched the footage from it in May. That must have been pretty cool. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, the prostate cancer diagnosis actually came, we were supposed to, uh, do a tour in England and just through a routine blood test, I had, um, I had a really high PSA number, prostate specific antigen, Yeah, which led to the diagnosis, which ended up canceling that tour, but we played one show, um, in, um, uh last year in july and then right after that i had my prostate out and then this year ultra bomb finally get, gets out back out on the road the record finally comes out uh yeah that tour was great uh, we played um 17 shows in 21 days and wow. two two gigs at punk rock bowling um uh, uh a sold out club show that we played with the Dickies. And then we were on the main stage on the last day. Uh, and it was great. Punk rock bowling was amazing. 
Yeah, and it ended up on the internet too. Life changing so experience. See. Yeah, I was yeah. fantastic. So, is this something you're going to continue to do? Uh, yeah, Ultra Bomb is definitely going to continue. We're um, uh, working on a second album right now. Uh, DC Jam Records is um, uh, putting out the new record, and <clears throat> hopefully, we'll have it all wrapped up by the end of the year and the record. Uh, for a, um, a late spring release and uh, the plan is to for the band to get over and play uh, some uh, dates in, in Ireland and England and Scotland uh, later this fall and then once the record comes out next year Ultra Bomb is going to be hitting the, the U.S. a lot we'll make it to the east coast we'll get you know the west coast we'll basically we're hoping to do at least three excuse me, three tours next year. You're back in the game now. <laughs> back in the game, yeah. I figured. Before I let you go, a couple of my friends uh, told me to uh, mention a couple of things to you. I don't know if you remember Al Quint. He's a writer. I uh, worked, wrote, you know, Suburban Voice, uh, Suburban Punk, Maximum Rock and Roll. He told me that yeah. on the last Husker Du tour, that you helped him sell his fanzine in the doorway in Providence at the show. <laughs> he told me yep. to bring that up to you. <laughs> yep. Al is a lifer, man. He's been, he knows more about punk and hardcore than like anybody I know. He, him and Mike Gitter, those guys, if you want to know anything, you call them and they seem to know. And the other guy is uh, Tom Wilson, the roadie. Um, I think he said he hung out with you in Toledo. Or something uh, cure and depeche maybe, mode yeah. and started off as a hardcore guy and he worked with the cure and depeche mode and cold play and they those guys just said to say hi so well, right on tell them i say hello <laughs> back <laughs> but uh thanks a lot man you gave me you're a great person to interview i didn't have to ask a lot of questions you you remembered everything and you told me the whole story and i appreciate <laughs> that man yeah, no problem. It's um, yeah, it's a crazy story. It's fun to tell. And good luck to you with Ultra Bomb. I hope to catch you guys when you get to the East Coast. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Thanks a lot. And good luck. Stay healthy. And I wish you well, man. Yep. Thanks, Rico. All right. Take care. Yep. Bye.